the seats, please. Um, well, let me give you a, a proper good morning and welcome to uh, The Pharmacy Show. My name is Richard Thomas. Uh, I'm the editor of uh, Pharmacy Magazine. Uh, but today I'm going to be chairing uh, the business sessions in the keynote theatre. Um, and I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be a very interesting and um, informative day. Um, I'm often asked, what does an editor actually do? Um, and I always refer to this quote by uh, the American politician Adlai Stevenson who says, an editor is someone who separates the wheat from the chaff um, and then prints the chaff. It's not really nice. Or this is another quote I like to, to uh, refer to. Nicholas Tomlin was an English journalist in the mid-20th century and he said, an editor must show rat-like cunning, a plausible manner and just a little literary ability. Well, I've certainly got a little literary ability. Um, none of that today, though. We've got a lot to get through. Um, I'm a pharmacist. I've been on the register uh, since 1987, um, and I've been a journalist and an editor since 1994, and I can never recall the pharmacy news cycle moving so quickly um, or the challenges facing pharmacists being greater or more numerous uh, than they are today. Um, pharmacists have been overwhelmed by a, a tidal wave of change, as well as massive financial uncertainty. And it doesn't matter where you look, the storm clouds appear to be gathering, whether it's macro, economic, NHS, business. The challenges um, are everywhere, and the threat to the sector I think is almost existential in nature. And of course, overshadowing everything are, are the funding cuts um, in England. Sorry, the efficiency savings, as the government calls them. And now, as you will know uh, only too well, they're beginning to have the severest of impacts uh, on the ground. Um, this slide, uh, the data for which was kindly provided by PSNC, shows how pharmacy funding per item is now at a lower level than at any time since 2005-06, while inflation since that time has pushed up prices and costs by nearly a third. Uh, and with prescription numbers going up by a third too since 2006, they're now over one billion, um, and funding seemingly going in the, the opposite direction, this represents incredible productivity, if nothing else. Uh, to coin a phrase, this is absolutely doing more for less. And that's not taking into account MURs, NMS interventions, flu vaccinations, over half a million already done this year, which is fantastic. And the countless interventions, large or small, that take place every day in every pharmacy that make a material impact on the health of people and communities and that's not bad, is it, for a bunch of shampoo and sandwich merchants who dole out medicines. Um, memo to the Department of Health, if you're going to engage constructively with pharmacy, uh, don't demean or belittle us. But it's not sustainable, is it? And no amount of commitment or skill can make up for a lack of resource at the end of the day. Pharmacy's economic model, to me, seems bust. The practice model is, is bursting and it's no use pretending otherwise. And expecting pharmacies to continue to create efficiencies without investment and fair funding is to expect the impossible. The sponge has been wrung dry and it's definitely time for a new approach. But on top of this, questions are being asked, aren't they, at the highest level about community pharmacists' ability, capacity and even willingness uh, to play their part in things like improving medicine safety, optimising medicines use, tackling some of these severe population health problems that we're facing at the moment, or integrating with health and social care. To which I say, well, all these things are absolutely achievable and they're, they're happening right now. Um, there's certainly no shortage of willingness or desire on the part of the sector to move forward. And the community pharmacy forward view, I thought, demonstrated that, but it is very difficult 
isn't it, to develop the service when pharmacy in England, at least, is being brought to its knees with funding that's being ripped out of the system in such a draconian and short-sighted manner. So it seems to me that pharmacy has got some fundamental questions that it needs to address, and it needs to do it quickly. Here are some of them. How do we start influencing and winning the policy debate at the top levels of government and the NHS, and locally too? At a national level, how can we rebuild trust and move from confrontation to constructive collaboration? And if the contract really isn't fit for purpose, how do we transition towards a more sustainable funding model? Some more questions. Where do we fit into the NHS forward view and new models of care? Why do we always seem to be waiting for permission? How do we improve the consistency and the quality of our service delivery? How do we better support new service implementation? How can we harness technology that creates the headroom to provide more clinical services by pharmacists and their teams, yet protects the integrity and the access of the bricks and mortar pharmacy network? What regulatory and legislative changes are needed to liberate pharmacists' clinical skills and empower the whole pharmacy team to meet the expectations that are being placed upon you guys? And finally, learn the lessons. Things are going quite well in certain areas, you know. It seems to be going quite smoothly in Scotland at the moment. Well. That's a kind of framework, I think, for our discussions today. Um, important issues, and hopefully we can shed some, uh, some light on them. Um, my role as chair today is actually to be um, as unobtrusive as possible uh, and to keep people to time. I've reported many conferences where the, the chair has tried to be the star of the show. Uh, my commitment to you is I'm not going to do that today. If I do, I'm sure you let me know via Twitter, which is a bit of a risk, I know. Um, our speaker's role and our panelist's role, I think, is to tease apart some of the complexities of these issues uh, and to provide you with some much-needed clarity um, so you can go away from here having a better idea of what's going on. You can go back to your pharmacies and your businesses and, and you can equip yourselves accordingly. So I suppose I'm looking from our speakers today for, for sound uh, guidance rather than sound bites. Um, and your role in all of this is very simple. It, it's to listen, it's to engage constructively, uh, it's to ask the questions that, that you want answered, and not just here in the keynote theatre, um, but throughout the pharmacy show today or if you're coming tomorrow, tomorrow as well. There's not many opportunities nowadays where the entire community pharmacy family kind of comes together and you can have a chat to professional leaders and you can exchange ideas, problems, solutions uh, with your peers. So I really do urge you to, to make the most of the opportunities uh, in this year's pharmacy show and I really hope that you get what you want out of it. Um, that's by way of a, a scene setter. Um, I think we know should move on to the main programme, which I'm going to do. Um, the organisers of this year's pharmacy show uh, have assembled an exceptionally strong uh, lineup of influential professional and NHS leaders and innovators, and some of whom will be very familiar to you. Just balancing the thing there. Um, but they've also made a determined effort to, to take a broader perspective by going outside the narrow confines of community pharmacy. And our first speaker today is a very good example of that. Richard Seal works jointly between NHS Improvement and NHS England to provide leadership on pharmacy transformation and medicines optimization. And prior to this, uh, Richard held senior leadership roles within the NHS Trust Development Authority, NHS West Midlands, NHS Institute for Innovation and Improvement, and Richard was the first Director of Medicines Management at the National Prescribing Centre. So as you can tell, medicines optimization is very much Richard's thing. Uh, in 2016, he was appointed uh, as Fellow of NICE and is currently undertaking a research doctorate in pharmacy at Aston University, focusing quality management systems uh, in pharmacy. And 
Rich, who would have thought we'd do all this during those late night drinking sessions at the pot of beer uh, uh, at Aston University? We were together at university in, in the mid 80s. Um, but Richard is going to talk about none of that. He's going to talk about the NHS England's Medicines Value Programme, which was set up to improve health outcomes and ensure taxpayers are getting best value from the NHS Medicines Bill. Rich is going to explain about the work of NHS England's Regional Medicines Optimization Committees and finish with a few words on pharmacy integration and how health professionals need to work together, including community pharmacists, to increase um, safety, improve medicines outcomes and to reduce waste. So without more ado, let me hand over to Richard Seal. Okay, thanks Rich. Good morning everybody. Good morning everybody. Ah, the mic's on, thank you. Uh, welcome to Birmingham, my hometown. I'm glad you found your way to the building site. It sounds as though we've uh, got some construction work going on, on next door. Uh, Richard uh, Thomas is, is quaking in his boots at the moment because, as he's already alluded to, he and I were at university together. Uh, and I think our first uh, encounter with each other professionally was in the, in the form of a pantomime, which I wrote and he starred in. So uh, if you want to uh, know a little bit more about that, perhaps you'll catch up with him later on. But more seriously, um, I am, as Richard said, a... Uh, newly appointed regional lead pharmacist in NHS England in England, so the focus of my work uh, is very much around what happens in, um, in England rather than Wales and Scotland, but I think there will also be some take-home messages for those of you that may be working uh, in, in the other the countries. So today what I really wanted to touch on was a, a number of things. How do we obtain best value from medicines? Um, looking at what new initiatives are being put in place in NHS England, um, how the infrastructure is being developed to support that to happen, um, looking at regional medicines optimization committees, and then talking about roles for pharmacy. And Richard's already painted rather a gloomy, I think, picture of where pharmacy is, and there is no question in my mind um, that pharmacy certainly is in a point of transition. I think throughout my whole of my career, somebody said we're at a crossroads. Well, I think we're at the crossroads now where there is fantastic opportunity for pharmacy to step up to plate. Now, actually, I would go so far as to say it's an expectation that pharmacy will step up to the plate. I understand um, the challenges that are being faced and some of the pressures that are being put on, particularly in community pharmacy, but I just also wanted to reflect for you what's actually happening in hospital pharmacy and the kind of pressures that they're facing too. So medicines are our business aren't they? Medicines are our lives. But sometimes when we're close to something, I think there is a temptation for us to take things for granted. And certainly in the case of medicines, we need to make sure that medicines aren't taken for granted. If we carry on doing what we've always done, we will get the same results as we've always got, whether that's in terms of outcomes for patients or satisfaction with our own profession. Uh, and our professional work. It is true, and my 81-year-old mom, who is going to have her birthday in two weeks' time, is a good example of somebody who needs help with their medicines. Um, fortunately, she's got me, um, or maybe unfortunately, she's got me, um, to help her with that. But there is no question that people are still suffering as a result of things that happen that go wrong with their medicines, that they need more support with. Medication safety continues to be a, a serious issue. I work a lot with hospital pharmacy trusts as well as primary care and community pharmacy. And my sister, this is a very family focused thing I know this morning, but my sister is actually a, a nurse, a call handle, handler for NHS 111. During her shift, she tells me that 40% of the calls she, she takes have something to do with medicines. Now often, this is a supply issue, but very often it's also people not getting access to the advice or the services that they feel they need to enable them to take their medication safely. And the consequences of that can be quite traumatic. An admission to hospital, and none of us want to go into hospital unless we absolutely have to, and yet people are still going in. Between 5 and 8%, nice tell us, are, resulting, uh, are, are ending up in hospital as a result of something that happens with their medicines. We also have 
the prospect of antimicrobial resistance. Now, that may feel very, very far away, um, but in case you weren't aware, antimicrobial resistance after terrorism is one of the biggest threats to the UK, and it's on COBRA's standing agenda. So COBRA is the, the as you know, the, uh, uh, the government um, uh, response committee, and antimicrobial resistance is up there. When I go into hospitals and when I talk to, to GPs and pharmacists, um, they tell me that the antibiotics that they've been used to using up until now are no longer working. We're having to look for new innovative treatments. We're having to go back down the drug discovery route to try and find novel compounds so that the everyday surgery that we've come to live and know uh, uh, as a result of, 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 of uh, health services being provided before, in, a, in order for that to continue to happen, then we need to make sure that we conserve antibiotics. We also know the age-old problem of adherence, concordance, call it whatever you will, helping people to take their medicines. And we're still not getting it right. We still know that up to half of people don't take their medicines as intended. And the consequences of that uh, are they're not getting the therapeutic be benefits or, worse still, they're suffering harm as a result. I started off by saying I'm going to talk about value. And actually, we also need to think about the bottom line. The NHS invests £16.8 billion pounds a year on medicines. And we have to ask ourselves the question, are we getting the best return on our investment for that? Can, could, are there other things that we could be doing? I've already mentioned we need to change. And the need for change is acute. This is taken from the NHS five-year forward view. And it outlines three areas where we need to think about doing things differently in order to be able to provide services for the patients that we want to do in a sustainable way. And it talks about needing to close three gaps. The health and well-being gap. Our focus has traditionally been on illness. And focus needs to shift radically towards prevention, helping people from falling in the river upstream rather than fishing them out further down when they're already half drowned. We also need to look at the way in which we provide services in the NHS. It used to be that there was a hospital in every local district. But that is not the way things are going to be going forward. The majority of care is not going to be provided in hospitals. It's going to be where patients actually want it, closer to home. And we need to make sure that the services that we're developing are actually fit for the future, that we start to bridge the gap between um, the care where it's provided now and the care where it needs to be provided going forward. It is unsustainable to have a district general hospital, as we've been used to, on every street corner. We need to look at getting better value for the investment we make in the NHS estate and make better value uh, use of uh, uh, su uh, more sustainable uh, organisational forms going forward. There is always a bottom line, and as businessmen you'll know this better than most, but we also need to look at return on investment, that £16.8 billion we, we, uh, we put into medicines in England every year. There is a gap between what we can afford to do and what we can actually do, and that gap is growing, and we need to do something about it. This is where the NHS five-year forward view comes in. It lays out a vision for how we address those three gaps. And it talks, particularly the latest uh, update, five-year forward view, next steps. And if you haven't read it, it's pages 41 and 42 that you need to look at. Because for the first time in that kind of document, it talks about medicines and it talks about pharmacy. And it's important that you know what it says. But in the broader context, it talks about GP surgeries beginning to work in networks. I remember having a conversation when I was at the Health Authority about 10 or 15 years ago with my LPC about the radical idea of perhaps having pharmacy federations who weren't competing on dispensing income, but actually collaborating on clinical services. That's exactly what we're seeing in general practice now. General practices are coming together, working together, as federations 
to develop better services for patients, to begin to invest in primary care services which are not just about doctors but include community nursing, mental health and really, really importantly, and I take this as a huge positive, clinical pharmacy teams. We'll come back to that in a moment or two. We'll have diagnostics and all of the technology that's developing around closer to patient diagnostics available to us. Some of you may already be using some of these. And they will also have pooled responsibility for providing urgent care and extended access to services, not from nine to five, but seven days a week, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. They are working far more closely with community pharmacy than ever before. And I think they are looking to us as a profession to help them to do that. Our role in all of that, getting the best value for medicines and pharmacy, but more importantly, providing services that we know that patients actually need. And NHS funding is, um, used to be one of those things that had the most in impact and outcomes for patients, but actually our professionalism and the ways that we work um, are hugely significant from my point of view, but we need to change. I was reading through um, an article the other day uh, and I just uh, refer you to that, that quote at the top there. This isn't from a f community pharmacist in the UK. This isn't from a pharmacist in England. This is actually a pharmacist in the United States and she's just embarking on her career. And what she said was, the profession of pharmacy is at a significant crossroads. That rings a bit of a bell, doesn't it? And what she also says is that the future, from her perspective, is not one of being involved in the medicine, as involved in the medicine supply chain, but actually one as being a clinical practitioner, a clinical healthcare provider, specialising in medicines use and drug therapy and treatments. Two or three years ago, the Royal Pharmaceutical Society commissioned to work to help us look at where we are in terms of a profession. And it came up, as you know, with some interesting um, observations and some recommendations. What it said was, pharmacy must be start to become far more coherent. It needs to be able to demonstrate and narrate its unique selling point. It needs to be able to do that without worrying about what kind of pharmacist, what flavour of pharmacist you are and where you work. It also said there are huge opportunities, which I firmly believe, um, in the five-year forward view, and we've had the community pharmacy forward view as part of that. But something I really wanted to draw your attention to is one at the bottom of the slide. If you haven't seen the work of Simon Sinek, it's worth a, a look. There's some fantastic TED videos on YouTube. And what Simon says is that people don't buy what it is you do they buy why you do it. So my challenge to the profession, to us here sitting today and to all those folk out there, is to get our heads a bit better around why we do it rather than what it is that we do. To help you with that, the Royal Pharmaceutical Society produced its medicines optimization framework. And this very much is um, how the medicines value program has been constructed, it is around this. I'm hoping that I don't have to do the test of how many elements and how many principles there are in this because this should be what you're doing every day. You may not describe it in this way, but this is very much the focus, what I think, of why we do what we do. It is about helping patients predominantly to uh, improve outcomes from their medicines, to help them take their medicines correctly, and I know many of you are doing that on an hourly basis, day by day, but also to look at avoiding them taking unnecessary medicines. I mentioned my dear old mum, 81. She's been to her GP this week. They've added yet another three meds, two of which she doesn't actually need. So we're still not getting it right for her, and I suspect we're still not getting it right for, for many of the people that you have in your care too. And that's resu resulted in, redu in waste. I, I went into, they've had some new wardrobes uh, fitted in their back room. God only knows why. I think when you get old, you just accumulate a lot of clothes. But I opened one of the doors and it was stacked from floor to ceiling with medicines. There was enough laxedo to clear the whole population of Birmingham, I believe. 
And I said, Mom, why have you got this? She said, well, it was on the repeat prescription and I didn't like to say no. I feel guilty now as a pharmacist. I probably should be in there doing something about it. But also, she's now got those lying around the house. I've got a little niece. She's four years old. She goes around to see Nana and Grandad. And she potters around the house. I dread to think what might happen if she opened that wardrobe door in a quiet moment when she's on her own exploring and started to take some of those medicines. It just doesn't beg, it begs belief that, that we still get in those situations. So it is a strategic priority for the NHS to, uh, for, for medicines and pharmacy, as outlined in the five-year forward view, um, to deliver a medicines value programme, to get better use from the medicines that we actually invest in. So what is the Medicines Value Programme? And I apologise, Sunday morning, a bit bleary-eyed, probably a bit small text. But essentially what it's saying is that the NHS wants patients, wants people to get better results from their medicines and also to, as we also have a duty and a responsibility to where we can achieve good value, best value for the taxpayer. So the Medicines Value Programme is a, a relatively new initiative uh, it operates across NHS Improvement and NHS England, hence the reason I'm appointed into a joint post. It includes NHS Digital, and I know they are here today. If you haven't seen the work they're doing uh, around medicines data, then go and have a look at it because it's important. Uh, and also it includes Health Education England. So what we're beginning to see in the Medicines Value Programme is much more of an alignment of um, uh, resources and infrastructure around pharmacy and medicines agenda. It's split up into four domains. You can see the four there. The first one really talks to NHS policy about access to and pr pricing of medicines, um, which I won't get into in great detail. Um, the second one is around commercial uh, arrangements and the agreements that are struck between the government and pharmaceutical companies and arrangements that influence prices of medicines. The, the, the bit that's really exciting and interesting and important from my point of view is the optimising use of medicines. The fourth bit, developing the infrastructure to support an efficient supply chain, includes things like um, money and resources and effort being put into things like um, digital, uh, things like automation and robotics, because they're coming like it or not. Um, and we need to think about how we do that most efficiently to improve access to medicines and to make best use of our skills by freeing up time to enable us to do the things which I think actually most of us want to do, which is provide good clinical services to our patients. Let's just reflect for a moment or two on what I actually mean by medicine's value. If somebody comes and says to you, what, what, what do we mean by medicine's value? Well, here's a, a very simple equation. From our perspective, my perspective, value, value is about the outcomes that we get and from a patient perspective, the things that matter to patients fewer side effects, better access to medicines, medicines at a time and a place in the right dose, right formulation that I need it at, divided by the cost. And some of the elements of that equation you can see might fit in at the top there. So looking at outcomes, measurable improvements in patient outcomes, but also at the same time keeping an eye on an affordable drugs bill. There are lots and lots of medicines coming down the innovation pipeline, which we need to think about how we're going to create headroom to be able to afford. They are not cheap. They are miraculous, but they are not cheap. And unless we actually start to make better use of the, the resources that we have available, we won't have the headroom to introduce those new medicines. We need to look about how we purchase and supply medicines and make that more efficient and as productive as it can be. It is about making sure, as I've said, patients get the right choice of medicines. And finally, about improving quality, which components of which are safety, effectiveness, patient experience. So how is all that going to happen? Well, there are some infrastructure developments, and I'm, for better or worse, part of that. So this is the new infrastructure for pharmacy within uh, NHS in England. It is something which we have not had for some time, and I know many of you, particularly through LPCs and LPNs, have frustrated, been frustrated that you haven't had anybody to talk to. How do you get to the conversations? How do you get your concerns fed up to the top? Well, and maybe fed up is the right word, but how do you get them through 
to the people who are making the decisions at the top. Well, we have a Chief Pharmaceutical Officer for England, many of you know and have seen, Dr Keith Ridge. Um, he has now appointed two deputies to himself, one sitting in NHS England and looking after the community pharmacy and um, primary care side of, of the world, the stuff that NHS England commissions, which includes commissioning of specialised medicines, and he has a deputy in NHS Improvement. I'm one of that central uh, group for regional pharmacists, uh, one in each of the four NHS England regions, London, Midlands and East. I am the pharmacist for Midlands and East, uh, North and South. And part of our role is about providing oversight and support for regional medicines optimization committees, more of which are non. I guess most of you working in community pharmacy will probably be more interested in. So how does that translate into what I do in my daily business? How does that impact on the services I'm trying to develop, the services I'm trying to provide? And so it's the outputs of those committees which are supported by the NHS Specialist Pharmacy Service um, which we need to think about. How do you tap into drug and therapeutics committees? How do you feed in through CCG area prescribing committees and so on and so forth? So that's the one part of the picture. The other part of the picture, and this again is incredibly important, is um, Dr Ridge has managed to negotiate with Health Education England to the point for pharmacy deans. These are people who are going to specifically, whose task it is to specifically look at the training, education uh, and development needs of pharmacy professionals, pharmacists, pharmacy technicians, and our associated staff. That's just a very quick rogues gallery uh, of, it's always useful to put names to faces and faces to names, so down the left hand side the regional pharmacists, Michelle Cossey, myself, David Webb for London and Steve Brown uh, for the south, and our pharmacy deans, you might say we're a Carol Blackshaw and Ros Cheeseman because they're actually sharing a post. Um, they were a bit shy in sending their photos over, which probably just as well because I couldn't get them on the slide anyway. Um, but those are people that hopefully um, will be in touch with you who you feel you will be able to go to and have a conversation with about training and development needs for your, for your professional uh, uh, careers. So what are we actually going to be doing? This is really, and it's an emerging role because the appointments have only been made since April, but helping to deliver the Medicines Value Programme, that stuff I was talking about in previous slides, promoting system alignment, and I, I know from past experience that community pharmacy quite often feels left out, outside of the conversations that are going on, so part of our role is to help to join some of that up and also get NHS Improvement, Health Education England, Public Health England, the arm length bodies, instead of pulling in divergent directions, hopefully beginning to be more convergent on delivering the Medicines Value Programme. We will be providing professional leadership. Um, that includes looking at things like the pipelines for uh, senior leadership at local level, chief pharmacists uh, and primary care pharmacists, making sure we have the right quality and quantity of people coming down the pipeline. Driving improvements in resource outcomes and patient experience, that is the very quintessential essence of the Medicines Value Programme. Um, and then optimising the use of medicines, and one of the ways in which we'll be doing that is through regional medicines optimisation committees, and some of the things are on the, on the agenda, some of them perhaps be more familiar to you, maybe some less so, but things like uptake of biosimilar medicines, these are biological molecules which are very similar to the originator product, um, but at hugely reduced cost uh, to the NHS, thereby offering um, a, a better value. I'll just give you one example. Infliximab uh, is a drug commonly used in hospitals. At the beginning of this um, period of work that we were doing, we were paying uh, over £9 million a month in the NHS for this just one drug. Had we continued to pay the prices that we started off at, the originator price, we would currently be paying £18 million a month. The fact that we've actually been able to move to biosimilar medicine has reduced that back down to £9 million. So if you can do the maths on a Sunday morning, and I apologise, that means we can treat twice as many patients for the same amount of money, with essentially, to all intents and purposes, exactly the same drug. 
What's a Regional Medicines Optimisation Committee? Well, it's four committees actually, but acting as part of one system. What are their roles? They've been commissioned by NHS England, and their roles are to monitor and support implementation of advice and guidance. So some of you might have been involved with drug and therapeutics committees previously, or area prescribing committees. Um, there's an awful lot of duplication of, and replication of work that's gone on in the NHS, partly as a result of the reorganisation, all happening at local level. And a huge industry has potentially developed about doing exactly the sort, same sort of thing, developing antibiotic prescribing guidelines, making decisions about whether something is going to be commissioned locally or not. One of the reasons for having the Regional Medicines Optimisation Committees is to answer the question, are there some things that could be done more productively at national level once and shared rather than 350 times and then we're trying to work out who does what with where and who and how. We will be looking at um, providing consistent advice and medicines optimisation. As I've said, reducing duplication at lower level. We'll also be horizon scanning for things that are coming down the pipeline. It may be drug developments. It may be new ways of doing things. Our initial priorities are those there on the screen in the little blue box. Biosimilars I've talked about. Inappropriate polypharmacy, a huge area where there is potential for community pharmacy to contribute. Um, care homes medicines optimization again a really significant opportunity for community pharmacy with the skills that you've got and the patients that you know uh, very very well indeed to get involved with that antimicrobial resistance huge huge global problem but also this new agenda around personalized medicines and the whole impact of technology and genomics and all of that and medicines which are going to be derived in very, very different ways to the way we've been used to having them previously. How does the operating model work? I won't dwell over this because it's a fairly, I think, simplistic way of, of describing it, but it basically stuff goes in at the top through local stakeholders and it's really important for you to appreciate that we are hoping that community pharmacy will contribute questions, examples of things that you need some help with through the, through the Regional Medicines Optimization Committees. Um, you'll be able to do it through the SPS website. It's currently in beta uh, form and it should be going live sometime in November. Um, all you will need to do is fill in a fa fairly simple form and then that will go up to the uh, prioritization uh, aspects of the committee. It'll, the topic will then be allocated to one of the four Regional Medicines Optimization Committees we will produce recommendations and then those will be disseminated out through the service and again it's important that you are part of that system for disseminating evidence and advice um, and finally there will be an element of evaluation and feedback. So those committees have all met at least once. Community pharmacy you'll be delighted to know is represented in my area um, Midlands and East it's Professor Tracy Thornley, who I know many of you will know, is both a community pharmacist working for Boots, but also has an academic hat on as well and works out of Nottingham University. So really good person to have, somebody who's close to the evidence about what it is that we do as a profession and how we improve care for patients. And we're delighted to have her on our, on our group. But each of the other three have also got community pharmacy rep representation as well. Um, this is to give you, who, who sits on these committees, well they are quite big, I mean the geographical area is actually quite big, but actually more importantly we wanted to make sure that these were going to be multidisciplinary and that we got the best of access to the best available advice from both providers, commissioners of care, we've got public health and lay representation as well, um, and having been at our first meeting in Midlands and East, I'm absolutely delighted about the level of debate and the level of discussion that has gone forward from those. I just wanted to focus for the last five minutes or so on change and in, in pharmacy. And I know probably all of you are community pharmacists here and traditionally there's been a bit of a, a divide between hospital and community and primary care pharmacy. We're really good at working in silos, aren't we? Really good. 
just to give you a small insight into what's actually happening in hospital pharmacy, because I think there are some really interesting and important lessons that can be learned. Lord Carter of Coles was commissioned um, by government to actually look at how the NHS could improve its productivity and efficiency in hospitals. And one of the big sections of that work was looking at hospital pharmacy and medicines optimization. If you haven't seen it, um, it's a relatively easy read. Just type in Carter Productivity and Efficiency into Google and then there is a complete section on hospital pharmacy and medicines optimization. It is all about delivering better value and obtaining better value from medicines, which is what I've been trying to talk about this morning. Back in 2014, cost of medicines in hospitals about £6 billion a year. The cost of providing the pharmacy services around that, 0.7 billion. The thesis is, and what Lord Carter says is, we need to release the time of these well-trained, competent professionals, these people, to be able to do clinical work, to be pa become part of the multidisciplinary team, using their expertise around medicine's use. In order to do that, we need to bring them in, not by spending more money, so if you look at the workforce, it's 0 0.7, but actually bringing them in closer to deliver medicine's optimization services. So he said, our pharmacists and clinical pharmacy technicians, because they are a hugely important part of our workforce too, must spend much more time on clinical pharmacy services than on inf infrastructure activities. So each hospital has been asked to put together a hospital pharmacy transformation plan, and one of the challenges to them is to, is to say, look at your infrastructure services. Look at how you are dispensing and supplying medicines. Look at the supply chain. At the moment, most hospitals have their own dispensary, they have their own buying office, they have their own medicines information services, they have their own technical services. Going right back to the very beginning and what I said, that doesn't seem to me to be good value for investment in services going forward. It's not modern and there are opportunities potentially to consolidate and work in different ways. You go into a hospital pharmacy now, the majority of them have got robotic dispensing. Some of them are actually dispensing for more than one hospital. It is the future, it's the way forward. The other revolution that I think we all have got to come to terms with and get a better grip on is clinical informatics and the fact that we can use and combine data sets as previously we've not been able to, to help us in our business and particularly to help us around medicines optimization. So what Lord Carter said was we need more clinical staff working more closely alongside patients, doctors and nurses, and also independently as clinical practitioners in their own right, to deliver optimal use of medicines, informed medicines choices, better value, and driving better outcomes for that patients seven days a week. Now that has been a revolution for hospital. Most of them have traditionally provided five-day services, nine to five, with a bit at the weekend if you needed it. What we're talking about is tr radically transforming it so that actually we've got uh, clinical pharmacists and clinical pharmacy technicians actually out with patients on the ward, sitting alongside doctors and sitting alongside nurses, contributing to their care. There are some parallels with what's beginning to happen in other sectors, and I wanted to just spend some time on that hospital part of it to help you see that actually this is something which is happening across the whole profession, not bits of it. We are seeing a lot of investment in new ways of delivering services. We have managed to um, obtain funding to get pharmacists working in integrated care hubs and as part of NHS 111, you remember the reference I made to 40% of my sister's calls to NHS 111 being around medicines. We're now getting pharmacists in those care pathways. We have got the urgent and uh, um, the NUMSAS, the um, uh, emergency medicine service, and I know that that is beginning to get traction, and we're getting to get some beginning to get some really good results as a result of services that you're providing. We've got the community ph pharmacy referral pilot. If I tell you a lot of my hospital chief pharmacist colleagues are looking for ways in which they can make it easier for you to do your jobs by 